A proper understanding of the grace of God doesn't free you to sin, but it frees you from sin. Today I'm going to talk about two reasons why a person living under grace doesn't live in sin. This will help you, so stay tuned for the Gospel Truth. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that emphasizes God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Friday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. So I've been teaching a lot of things. What I started doing yesterday is, is saying, all right, if God loves us and if it's His nature to love and He's not imputing our sins unto us, then why live holy? Paul had to deal with this, this question constantly. And in Romans chapter 6, he brings this up and he gives two answers in Romans chapter 6 why you live holy. The first one in Romans chapter 6, verse 2, it says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And he began to start talking about how that our old sin nature that compelled us to sin is gone. And so the number one reason why Christians don't live in sin is because it's not your nature to live in sin. If you missed some of my teaching yesterday, this is going to sound really off the wall because this is not what's being presented uh, in the majority of cases today. Most people are being told that they are schizophrenic, that they have the old sin nature and then they have a new born again nature and it's like a white dog, black dog that are just constantly fighting each other and against each other and whichever one you feed the most wins. Well, that's not the way that it is. Your sin nature has been taken away. And the only reason you sin as a Christian is because, like it says in verse 6, Romans 6, 6, you don't know this, or it's saying it in the positive way. You will experience the resurrection life of God if you know this, that your old man is dead, crucified with him. But if you don't know that, you won't experience this resurrection life. And this is where most Christians are. Most Christians have been made and told and led to believe that they are just an old sinner saved by grace. But you aren't an old sinner saved by grace. If you've been saved by grace, you have become a brand new person and it's your nature now to live holy. Man, that's good news. In verse 7 it says, For he that is dead is freed from sin. It didn't say that he that is dead is free from sin. It says he's been freed from sin. There's a difference. You could free a person and them not be free. They could have been freed and still not be free. For instance, the slaves in America back in the 1800s, President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. I believe it was June the 19th, 1863. And he freed all slaves. And yet back in those days, they didn't have the communication that we've got sometimes on those plantations. The slaves on those plantations were very isolated and it, they didn't have contact with outside people. And so some of those slave owners refused to give the information to their slaves that they had been freed and so these were freed people who were not free. They were still slaves. They were still being oppressed and beaten and, and uh, held against their will by slave owners because they didn't know the truth. Well, likewise, Jesus has freed us. We no longer have a sin nature that we are now still part of the devil, that there's just a nature of the devil that lives on the inside of us. No, we have been freed from that sin nature but we aren't all free because we don't know this. A lot of people still see themselves as an old sinner and so they just give token resistance and after a while get in because after all that's who you are. See this is where I have a uh, bone of contention with some of the self-help groups and I know I'll get criticism for this but I don't intend anything bad but like Alcoholic Anonymous Al-Anon and other things like that. I know that they have helped people to a degree, but they, one of the things that I disagree with on those programs like Alcoholic Anonymous is that you get up and you introduce yourself and if it was like me, I'd say, hello, my name is Andrew. I've been an alcoholic for 20 years and I've been for a dry for 10 years. But you still identify and see yourself as an alcoholic and they will say you're only one drink away. They don't believe in truly being free. 
They just believe in bridling, restraining yourself, and getting to where you don't go out and drink, but you can't change your nature. See, that's against true Christianity. True Christianity just doesn't restrain you so that you quit living in sin. But cr true Christianity changes your nature, and you don't want to sin. And so you break the actions of sin, not from the outside in, but you break it from the inside out. You get changed in your nature, and you quit acting out this sin because you don't desire to do it anymore. But see, these self-help groups, they don't see that. They still go around with an alcoholic mentality. They still go around with all of the guilt and the shame. They just have some liberty now because they aren't drunk all of the time. They have more money because they aren't spending their money on the booze. There are improvements, and they may have improved themselves dramatically, but they still have an alcoholic mentality. They still see themselves as that. And I just don't think that that's at all what this is talking about. It says, he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing. Now, see again, just a few verses earlier, it says that you are going to be resurrected with Christ, walk in this resurrection life knowing this. It's dependent upon you knowing the truth. Here again, it says in verse... 8, it says, Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him knowing that Christ... You have to know this. And here's what you have to know. That Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Now some people, when I'm talking about that we are dead unto sin, and that that sin nature has been crucified which is what it said in these previous verses. There are some people that will say, oh yes, I believe that I have been crucified with Christ and I am dead unto sin. I am dead unto that sin nature. My old man is dead. People will even embrace that and say it because it's said right here in Scripture. But then they will say, yeah, but my old man resurrects every day. It comes back to life. And I have to continually die to myself daily. I have to continually die over and over. Every day I get up and have to die to this old flesh. I was raised under that. I was taught this. I, I literally, some of you will think this is weird. And it is weird, but that's the way religion will make you. But I, I, when I was first getting started, I used to go through the actions of seeing myself sitting in an electric chair and I would strap myself in and I'd name my sins jealousy and pride and I'd strap myself in and say, Oh God, just kill this old man again today. Did you know that that didn't break the dominion of sin? What it did, I resurrected my old man. I was imputing unto the devil resurrection power. That's not what this is saying. Now look at this again. It says you have to know that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And then verse 11 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 11, likewise reckon you yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. Likewise as what? Likewise as Christ is dead unto sin. And it says he only died unto sin once and he dies no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. You need to recognize that when you made Jesus your Lord, God took that old man and killed it and took it out of the way. And you don't have an old man living on the inside of you. Now, you've got an unrenewed mind that is the fruit and the product of an old man that has to be renewed. And until you renew it, you're going to have some of the same temptations and some of the same thoughts and same memories and some of the same hurts and fears. But it all can be reprogrammed. It can be renewed. There is no longer at your core level, at your nature level, something inside of you that is just part devil. If you've been born again, you have passed from death unto life. You are no longer a child of the devil. You are now a child of God. And if you were to know that and reckon that it's dead, and in the same way that Jesus only died once, you only died once when you got born again, and you don't have to get up and resurrect your old man and impute unto it resurrection power every day. If you knew that and believed it, it would liberate you. You would walk free. Instead of just being freed, you would be free. 
big, big difference. And I tell you, this is a major problem uh, in the body of Christ because we don't know these things. And the results of all of this in verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. In other words, if you are truly free, if you're a brand new creature, and if you are no longer enslaved and shackled to the devil the way that we've been taught, then you don't have to let sin reign in your mortal body. Most people think, I can't help it. Flip Wilson said, the devil made me do it. The truth is, the devil can't make you do anything. If you believe that you're part devil, that your nature is still of the devil, then yes, you can't help it because after all, that is your nature. But if you understand that your nature has changed, that you are no longer by nature a child of the devil, then you can break the dominion of sin. You don't have to let sin reign because you're a brand new creature. That's not you anymore. You aren't enslaved to the devil anymore. Man, this is good news. I tell you, I can't tell you how good a news this is. This has transformed my life. I'm talking out of Romans chapter 6 about two reasons Paul gave why you don't live in sin. If God loves you independent of your sin, doesn't that just mean you can go live in sin? No, because number one, your nature has changed. And if you were to know the truth, this would set you free from sin, not set you free to sin. If you know the truth about you being a new person in Christ and the Lord no longer judging you according to your sin, it'll cause you to live holier accidentally than you ever have on purpose before. It's your nature to live holy. And let me just end up that first point with this verse out of Romans chapter 6 in verse 14. It says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. I've taught on that a lot during these last four weeks. And the law is just saying you are under a system of having to perform in order to get God's blessing. You don't have to earn God's blessing. It's grace. It comes by grace. And if you understand that, that will break the dominion of sin over you. If you are struggling and it seems like sin is winning and dominating you, then you are under the law and not under grace. I know some of you are struggling right now and saying, well, that doesn't make sense. It seems like it's just the opposite. If I was really under law and fearful of God's judgment, I think I'd live holier. I've gone to great expense in this teaching to show you that when the law is introduced and all of these commands and judgment, it may restrain the physical actions, but it's going to make you lust for sin greater than you ever have in the sin that you do commit. It's going to make you feel so condemned and so guilty it's going to hinder your relationship with God. So if you are still having sin dominate you, it's because you aren't under grace. You're under law. And then in verse 16, it says the second reason that you live holy now that we're under the grace of God. In verse 16, it says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, are of obedience unto righteousness. So here's the second reason that you live holy. The second reason is that if you go out and live in sin, even though God isn't going to bring His judgment upon you, this vertical effect of sin isn't going to happen. There is a horizontal effect of sin, and that is that every time you sin, you open up a door to the devil. It's like you just invite him in to bring all of his sickness, his disease, his depression, his destruction. To whom ye yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. When you yield to sin, you yield to Satan, the author of that sin. And the Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes for no other purpose except to steal, kill, and to destroy. If you open up a door to the devil... The only thing that's going to happen in your life is he will still kill and destroy from you. If you give Satan an inroad into your life, he's going to eat your lunch and pop the bag. You do not want that. So that's the second reason that you live holy. First reason you live holy is because your nature has been changed. You want to live holy. Every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. 1 John 3.3 3. The second reason you live holy is because... You don't want to give Satan an inroad into your life and to destroy you. Man, that is so obvious unto me. 
And yet when I start talking about that God loves us, independent of our performance, that it's grace, we aren't under law, immediately people come back and say, you're encouraging sin. I'm not encouraging anybody to sin. If you go live in sin, I believe you're absolutely stupid. But I'm saying God loves you stupid, amen. I'm saying God's not mad at you. God's not punishing you for your sin. But it's stupid to go live in sin because first of all, you're going to be violating your nature. It's inconceivable that a person who is truly born again would want to live in sin. Now, there are religious people who are just playing the game and have never had their nature changed that I can understand why they go live in sin because that's their nature. That's what they really are. So there's a lot of quote-unquote Christians who aren't truly born again and aren't true Christians that I can understand why they would go live in sin. But if you're truly born again, you want to live for God. That's one of the ways that you can tell if you're truly born again or not is your nature changed or your desires changed. Now, I'm not saying you fulfill those desires perfectly, but if you're truly born again, the desire is there. That's the first reason. Then the second reason, you don't want to give Satan an inroad into your life. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5 that your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, goes about seeking whom he may devour. Satan can't devour everybody. If Satan had his way, every person would be sick, every person would be broke, every person would be miserable, every person would be depressed. That is the nature of the devil, and that's what he would like to reproduce into every single person. But not every person is sick, broke, defeated, depressed, because he can't just devour everybody. How come he's able to prey on some people and not on others? Well, one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the big reasons is because some people yield to him. And just like Romans 6.16 6, says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey. If you yield to the devil, if you go out and get into strife and anger, if you go to stealing, if you go commit sexual immorality and things like that, you are just throwing the floodgates open and saying, Shoot your best shot. Destroy me if you can. And I guarantee you, Satan is a master at bringing death and destruction, stealing, killing, and destroying. And if you do that, you're just stupid to live that way. Paul wasn't preaching sin. I'm not preaching sin. I believe in living a holy life. And once again, let me just make this statement for those of you that haven't heard me a lot. Maybe you're just being exposed to the program and you're kind of new to it. You know, I've lived a super holy life, and I am really God, glad that God called me to preach this grace of God because uh, when you preach on grace, one of the immediate criticisms is people say, oh, you're just saying this so you can justify some terrible lifestyle, that you can go live in sin and say that God loves you anyway. I've lived a holier life than most of you have ever dreamed of. I have never said a word of profanity in all of my life. I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never tasted coffee. I am Mr. Righteous. But you know what? I needed salvation just the same as the person who's a murderer, liar, thief, anything else. Who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? I'm just saying, you cannot accuse me of preaching the grace of God as a license for my sin or a justification for my sin. And so that's going to take that criticism away from a lot of you. Some of you think, well, these people that preach grace, they just go live in sin. I'm living a stricter, holier life. I probably spend more time studying the Word, praying, and doing things than most of you do. You can't use that accusation. It says in Titus chapter 2, verse 12, that the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lust and to live soberly and righteously in this present world. If you truly understand grace, grace isn't a license to sin, but rather it's just the grace of God once you do sin that you know God doesn't reject you or love you more if you don't sin. God's love for me is not based on my performance. It's based on my acceptance of the Lord Jesus. Man, that is a major, major difference. Let me drop on down to a couple of other verses here in Romans chapter 6 and just end up with this. In Romans chapter 6, in verse 20, it says, For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Now, I'm going to go on and make another point out of this in, in verse 22, but let me first of all establish this terminology. When it says, when you were the servants of sin, 
That's talking about before you're born again. So servants to sin is talking about prior to salvation, you were free from righteousness. Now, free from righteousness doesn't mean that you couldn't do anything right. It just meant that that right action couldn't change your sinful nature. You had to be born again. You can't wipe out your past by making a New Year's resolution and promising you'll do better. You can't affect the past by doing better in the future. You have to be forgiven and born again. So this is saying that a lost man, a person who has not yet committed their life unto the Lord, their good actions don't make their nature good. Your actions can't change your nature. If you are a child of the devil by nature, you can go to church and pay your tithes and live holy and do as good as you want to, and that doesn't change your sinful nature. Now, most people would agree that that's what Romans chapter 6, verse 20 is saying. But now, drop on down to verse 22. It says, but now being made free from sin and servants to God. It's in the same context. It's using the exact same terminology, but now it's applying it in the opposite direction. So in verse 20, if it says, when you were free from uh, righteousness... That meant that you could do right acts, but it couldn't change your sin nature. Now in verse 22, it says that you are free from sin. Does this mean that, mean that a Christian can't sin? No, a Christian can still sin, but it's saying that once your nature has been changed and you have become righteous in your nature, your sin actions can't change your righteous nature and make you defiled anymore, any more than your righteous actions could have changed your sin nature before you got born again. You had to be born again, and you can't change that sin nature by right actions. You can't change your right nature by sin actions. Boy, to me, that's powerful. And then it goes on to say, and you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Holiness is a fruit and not a root of salvation. Big difference. By and large, the church today is saying holiness produces the relationship with God. But this is saying your relationship with God is what produces this fruit of holiness. I am not against holiness. I'm just against you using holiness as a way to relationship with God. No, you have relationship with God by faith and then that relationship produces holiness.